I'm John Weber, and I'm the director of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. And it is great to have all of you here today. Um, we had a wonderful performance today, both um, in front of the museum and online. And I, um, I know a number of you were there in person. We also had around um, close to 160 people um, seeing the performance streaming online. And I want to thank all of the artists um, who performed today, um, Anna Marine, Lara, if you could wave, um, Akiko Harakayama, uh, Rosamond King, Courtney Desiree Morris, and uh, the director of today's performance, Dilo. It's, it's great to have you here, and we're going to have a conversation moderated by Jillian Hernandez. And I'm just going to offer a few thanks and then be um, joining everyone in the audience. I'm looking forward to hearing about today's very very moving and very um, beautiful performance, um, Sanctuary. And uh, it was had co-sponsors all over the university. So we thank the University of Oregon's College of Arts and Sciences, um, the School of Art and Design, the Black Studies Program, the Lily Reynolds Parker Black Cultural Center, UO's Departments of Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, Theater Arts, English, Cinema Studies, and Indigenous Race and Ethnic Studies. Um, what a lineup of supporters. Um, thank you all for, for supporting this performance. Uh, we've been working on this really for about two years. It got postponed from last spring um, because of the virus and the pandemic, and we're so glad to be able to present it today. Um, just as the museum is actually reopening again. And this performance is part of a larger project that is the Black Lives Matter Artist Project Grant, and it will be represented in documentation in the show that will be opening in July. So please check our website for that. And we wanna thank um, Jordan Schnitzer, um, who funded that, that project, and the project was actually his idea, and also the Jordan Schnitzer Family Foundation for funding for that. And I want to thank um, Eris Hall and the Black Cultural Center for, for co-sponsoring that here on campus with the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. So um, the best thing is always to hear from the artists themselves, because they're the ones that make the work. And so that's why tonight is, is special. And um, thank you for being here. And now I would like to turn things over to Jillian Hernandez. And thanks to everybody. Hi, everyone. Good evening. I'm Jillian Hernandez. I'm an assistant professor in the Center for uh, Gender Sexualities and Women's Studies at the University of Florida. I'm also um, a curator of contemporary art and have long worked as a community arts educator. I'm so inspired by the sanctuary performance and what it presents to us as an opportunity to think through the ongoing legacies of colonialism um, and beyond that, how to heal, how to connect with one another, um, even in this moment of, um, of pandemic and ongoing um, settler colonial violence. Um, I am speaking to you all from um, Florida, which is traditional Seminole and Timucua, um, and Timucua land. Um, and I wanna acknowledge um, the Seminole and Timucua peoples and all of the displaced African-Americans um, on whose territory the University of Florida resides. Um, I also want to acknowledge and thank uh, the ancestors of everyone involved um, in this brilliant project. Um, so we encourage you all to participate actively in the conversation. Um, please feel free to send shout outs, notes of love, in the chat box, we love to see those and I'll be um, looking at those periodically and sharing your comments with the artists. Uh, we also have a Q&A box and if you could please use the Q&A box as a place to send um, any questions that you might want to um, have the panelists address and I'll make sure to um, to address those and, and have our panelists engage with that too. Um, so we expect a program of about an hour, maybe a little bit more. Um, I'm going to start off with a few questions um, and then the artists will also perhaps have a few questions uh, for each other and then we'll open it up to folks in the audience. So once again, um, thank you so much for being here. Um, I would like to start with, um, could the artists um, just 
briefly introduce themselves and um, discuss what your uh, contribution was to the project. Hi, my name is Anna Maureen Lara, and <clears throat> um, I'm one of the co-lead artists along with Akiko and Courtney and Rosemont. And um, I had the opportunity to work with Dilo, uh, who was directing. Um, I am a, primarily a novelist and a poet. I also do some scholarship in the area of queer studies and black studies and the intersections thereof, uh, specifically in the Caribbean. Um, but I also do performance art and, uh, and have been enjoying the processes and the discovery of performance art for about uh, 15 years now. So uh, this is really a labor of love and a ritual of joy that I feel so uh, grateful to have been able to discover and engage with uh, in this company, in this incredible company. Hi, Delo, would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Uh, I am Dilo, and I uh, am an actor, writer, comic, mostly right now, though I have been trained alongside um, Anna and Courtney um, and many other queer artists uh, in, in ways of ritual-based theater. And so um, shouting out some of our collaborators like Sharon Bridgeforth, Omi, um, Omi Oshun, and uh, Adelina Anthony, and um, other queer art performance practitioners. Thank you. Akiko, would you like to go next? Sure. Hi, my name is Akiko Hatakeyama. Um, I'm primarily a composer in the performer of intermediate art that includes performance, uh, live, also fixed media like you saw today. And also sometimes I also create uh, custom made instruments that would reflect my desire to move in certain ways and express what I'm trying to convey to the audience. Yeah, thank you. It's been a really incredible experience for the last past two years, the past two years. Um, yeah, I'm very lucky to be part of this, so thanks. Thank you. Courtney. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Courtney Desiree Morris, and I'm a visual and performance artist um, based in Berkeley, California on uh, unceded territory of the Wichino Loni. I um, also teach in the Department of Gender and Women's Studies at UC Berkeley, where I'm an assistant professor. I teach courses primarily in the areas of environmental racism, um, feminist environmental ethics, and looking at Black women's social movements in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, I've recently completed a book on social movement activism um, in Nicaragua. Hooray! Um, and I do a whole bunch of other stuff. And I'm so happy to be here and to be making this work with a community of folks, some people I've known for the better part of my adult life and some folks who I'm getting to know for the first time. And it's been a really rich and beautiful experience. And I'm very grateful to have been a part of Sanctuary. So thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, Rosamond. Hi, I am Rosamond S. King. And I am a creative and critical writer and performer. I write a lot of poetry. I do a fair amount of performance and I sometimes make things I like to call handmade books, but other people don't necessarily think that that's what they are. I usually draw on reality, often reality in general or the realities of black and queer folks to create non-literal representations of those experiences. And I am currently on Tonkawa Comanche and Lee Panapache land in San Antonio, which is a majority Mexican city, even though I'm usually on the Mape land and Canarsie land um, in Brooklyn within walking distance of an African burial ground. And it's been a real joy to work um, across digital space, physical space, and creative space with all of these wonderful people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so just as a starting point, um, I would love to hear um, about one, this would be a two-part question, one, how, how did the project come about? What was the germ 
of the project? And two, um, how did the pandemic shift that, right? So I was very much noticing the masks that were part of um, the ritual that was happening on campus, right? And even thinking about how that affected your, your collaborative process, right? Um, imagining at one point that this would not be a virtual, um, a virtual project, right? So, um, you know, first part on sort of the origin and then the second part on um, how you um, worked through um, really so, so movingly and so beautifully in collaborating together to produce this um, in a virtual format. I guess I'll take a go at the, um, oh, wait, wait, I'll take a go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, the, so I'll, I'll take a go at the kind of the seed of the piece. And I'd love to hear from my collaborators too um, around this question. Thank you, Jillian, for this beautiful question. Um, so for me, the last, you know, social justice is a lifelong process and, and like commitment. Um, the work of attempting to realize social justice and to live social justice and to embody freedom for me is a lifelong commitment, perhaps even an intergenerational commitment. And even within that, and even with having known um, struggle over the last, you know, like just what it means to be doing work in the face of so many policies that basically seek to extinguish the lives of those of us who are part of this work. Um, the last five years in particular have been horrendous. And so for me, um, really the seed of this piece began, uh, and I don't know if we actually talked about this, but it began uh, with, with the artists, but it began when um, the ban came down on people from Muslim countries. Mm. And that was the origin of the piece for me, uh, was mm -hmm. just this idea, this, this need in my body to resist all of these processes that were seeking to destroy our relationships, to destroy love and trust between our communities and also to destroy actual living people. Um, at the same time that was happening, if you'll remember the ICE detention started to ramp up excessively. And so the state of emergency in which the community here in Kalapuya Ilahi, also known uh, in English as Eugene, Oregon, was, was visible, was tactile, was on the skin, was under the skin, we were breathing the violence. And to be part of a university campus that was actually debating whether or not it would be a sanctuary campus, mm -hmm. that language of creating sanctuary mm -hmm. really had me thinking, you know, in the, the state of Oregon, whether it would be a sanctuary state or whether the city of Eugene would be a sanctuary city. And just kind of thinking through this idea of like, well, what are we actually talking about when we talk about sanctuary? Does it just mean that we have the detention camps right outside the city? You know, does it mean right. that does it mean that we're stopping people at the airport? Like, what is it? What does it mean? You know, and so watching all of this um, social and institutional violence uh, happen around me, and responding and supporting people I care about through all of this um, is that's what that's what planted the seed in me of what it of the idea of creating a performance piece that would allow us to think about sanctuary or that would ask us to think about sanctuary uh, in an active way. Thank you. Thank you for that. Do any of the other artists wanna, wanna add to that? I think in addition to that, um, in particular because we're at the beginning and so people are acknowledging the original stewards of the lands that they're on, that was something that we talked about from the very beginning. So it wasn't kind of a mm. rehearsal of, and you know, these are the names of the people whose land we're on, but right. it was really, what is the history of Eugene? And what is the history of racialized people in Eugene? And so one of the, one of the fissures of ending up doing the work um, predominantly digitally and distanced is that we actually had put, those of us who don't live there, had actually put in some effort to learn about this place. And then at least thus far, we haven't been able to travel there. And so that is, you know, that's that's interesting in terms of the work, but it also of course means that, you know, people anywhere who have access to the internet and to YouTube 
are now able to interact with the work. Right, that's that's such a great point. Um, and I wanted to maybe as a as a sort of you know um, extension from that, I was really struck by the um, by the the ways in which it seemed like um, the performances were staged in um, institutional settings. I'm not sure where your performances were, Courtney. I don't know if they were a campus or not, um, but. Um, to me, there was something really important about the fact that um, many of the performances we we saw were situated in institutional spaces. Um, in, and you know, Rosamond, you're, you're mentioning right this idea of like um, going beyond just the, the the acknowledgement right of of settler colonialism to really get into the history um, and have a kind of um, embodied aesthetic, you know, performative engagement with that history. Um, so um, were there like, uh, was there a sort of um, investment in kind of staging this as a sort of institutional um, action intervention? Um, I'll speak to that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I shot my pieces um, at the UC Berkeley campus. Mm -hmm. I live three blocks away. I'm, I live in the dorms. I'm a, like a faculty mom. In the <laughs> um, it's cute. And, um, you know, I mean, shooting in that space was, it was sort of equal parts pragmatic, but also aesthetic. I mean, part of it was that, you know, I have a new baby. It was mm -hmm. close to home. I could go in there and do the work really, really quickly. And I, throughout the pandemic, have been spending a lot of time, like the campus has effectively become this public park where a lot of people go to find relief, to get access to green space, to rest, to enjoy the good weather. It is, it is, an, it is in a lot of ways become this sort of um, a de facto sanctuary space for a lot of people mm. looking to find and create peace in their own lives in the middle of a very scary and stressful time. Certainly mm -hmm. it's been me. But I, you know, but as a, as a black woman who's embedded in that institution as a faculty member and who sort of understands, you know, academic spaces, um, the relationships that Black women have to the academy is one of profound violence and stress, right? So mm -hmm. there are institutions that actually don't give us sanctuary, that often don't take care of us, um, that often work us to death. And so it felt like, and you know, so there's that sort of layer of violence. And then there's this other added layer of violence, the, the, the kind of unstated violence of settler colonialism, where it's like, I, I work at an institution that Kind of prize itself on its progressive um, identity and progressive institutional culture, but it's also an institution that houses the bodies of some, like the remains of some 500 Ohlone people in its archives. <laughs> like there's a real mm -hmm. conflict between the way the institution sort of narrates itself, but then the actual role that it plays in kind of maintaining these systems of settler colonial violence um, and anti-Black violence that, you know, at the end of the day are really embedded in the foundations of how these institutions, it's part of the operating, uh, the, like the operating structure of how these institutions function. So for me, I really wanted to think about the first part of the ritual that I performed as kind of like, you know, it, it had multiple functions. It was kind of like an exorcism of sorts. It was also mm. a protection. But it was also, you know, meant to to speak to these forms of of latent violence that um, that I kind of wanted to surface in the piece, you know. And so that that for me felt really um, like a really generative space to do that work. And I did it in a in a building that houses one of the kind of natural sciences departments. So I also kind of wanted to play with that as well. Um, and then, you know, the part around the part of the performance that was that I did around the reflecting pool was really about, you know, it was it was next to a place where people go and hang out and there's lots of kids playing and doing their thing. And I was thinking like, wow, what does it mean that people are like people are dying by the literally by the thousands. And if you were to try to ring the alarm and let people know what was happening, would anybody stop and pay attention or even ask what you were doing and why you were doing it? And as it turned out, very few people wanted to to engage, which I thought was really revealing. It was, I, it was, it was super striking, um, even that some folks just like weren't looking that much, right? And there was a way in which it seemed like that was, that was obviously like, okay, right? But at the same time, I think, like you're saying, like said something um, about this way in which um, 
you know, um, these, these so-called public spaces, like, are they really places where people are coming together or not? And like, what are the sort of hierarchies that nevertheless sort of um, continue to adhere and structure um, these spaces that are supposedly self, uh, safe or, you know, quasi-radical um, spaces? Um, thank you for that, Courtney. So, um, so um, I would love to hear more I, I wanted about, to about your... Oh, please. I wanted, add, to, yes. I wanted to add to that, which is that one of the ways in which this piece changed is that actually there was an engagement with the intimacy of domestic spaces. And like, I really feel like that was reflected mm. very deeply. I mean, Akiko, for me, Akiko, your piece is like, you know, like the tiny microcosms of intimacy, you know, and Rosamond, like, rupturing public and you know the outside and the indoor spaces and this domestic intimacy mm -hmm. that was absolutely an outcome of us reimagining this piece in the context of the pandemic um because it was originally when we were going to do it live last may in 2020 it was going to be a series of processions that created intimacy ritualistic intimacy in public space and we were treating the university institution as a public space um, and, and purposely attempting to, to transform that space for black and brown and migrant bodies, right? And, and, um, and Asian bodies and, and just, um, and with the pandemic, there's sort of the transformation in space itself that happened through the work of creating the pieces in particular Rosamond and Akiko's pieces outside of institutional space. And, and I love that about this. Yeah, right. So there's different, there's sort of like these different portals and realms where um, the performance is, is happening. And, and I really love too how it moves also very seamlessly um, between live and recorded to the point where it's difficult to discern at some points um, what is and what isn't. And I love also the blurring of authorship like the ways in which, um, you know, authorship is really on the back end. Um, and I think it just said a lot about um, how you all sort of exchanged as artists in this project. So, um, you know, I love as a curator, like I'm interested in and love to hear like all the sort of back, back and, you know, backdoor details of, of the logistics um, of how you all work together, especially given that I imagine that some in-person meetings, retreats, uh, were perhaps, you know, imagined for the original, you know, live version. So um, I would love for you all to share just a little bit about your process, especially for folks who might be imagining their own sort of collaborative, um, collaborative works. I would just love to hear more about uh, the praxis, you know, the collaborative praxis that you all uh, worked from um, in, in, in making sanctuary happen. Dilo, do you want to talk a little bit to that since you helped guide it, guide that process? I think Rosamond's telling me to speak up. <laughs> um, so um, initially, well, I think that you know, I I I don't enjoy necessarily directing. I enjoy the process of collaboration with artists and mm -hmm. artists of artists who are coming to their work with deep questions and curiosity and and a deeper love right love for people and so all mm -hmm. these artists even though some knew others better or or Anna Anna was the hub and everybody said yes to to the project because of Anna mm -hmm. and then you could trust each other because of this connection to Anna mm -hmm. and then even the live performers on the Eugene side same thing people every people every, every person came by trust and said yes and said that yes emphatically like there was mm -hmm. it was an all-in type of situation and in those instances I I like even from the beginning before we knew the tech team and the collaborators just when you know that that's the energy that is being brought to the table you it, it makes it easier for me as a person who is taking a sort of director role um, to bring all the artists and energy and the conversation to, to go even deeper, mm -hmm. you know, for people to just have the space to marinate and play, 
because mm-hmm. that's what artists want and that's what artists need um, in order to respond to the, the absurd and the idiotic shit of the world. They just need time to just marinate and play. And so much of the process that I was um, leading, I guess, or guiding was about trying to understand per- personal relationship to this word and concept of sanctuary Mm. and also the cultural and political as well and all of the artists here are hella intelligent not just you know here but here with their art practice and so um, it was just about creating connective tissue between the artists and um, not necessarily getting on the same page, but sort of like pulling where where each artist was already thinking and where they were enjoying going to think and yeah. um, to feel. So that was kind of the process in the beginning. And then um, when pandemic hit and, and we just kind of put a pause on things and this and this word and the marinating with this concept was when I think went deeper for everybody. And then Um, I had the idea to have, you know, to do this performance. Yes, we could have pre-recorded everything, but then to be able to create performance and to have a live aspect of it, I think that we were just at that time where I was like, this is possible and it can be very powerful because everybody's been in this process for so long and can come forth with something that will feel like it is, connected and so um I, I mean I could talk about that part later but but really the artists have a have a better take on how they approach their own work for this final presentation thank you so much um mm-hmm. would anyone like to add to that right like what what the offering was and I just you know as, as viewing the live stream along with so many others like it was received in that spirit it was received as an offering and there was just so much connection and gratitude um and and I think you all you know you did it like you you did the work and I think for many folks um it was um a a healing space it was a space where I think a lot of processing affect prior to the pandemic during the pandemic you know during Gaza like you know this moment right now right um, I think that it just um, definitely, I think, spoke to us in on so many on so many levels. Um, so, is there interest among the artists in maybe talking a little bit about um, either the collaborative process or your own um, particular contribution um, to it? I'd like to share just a, a little piece and. Sure. I acknowledge uh, what one part of our core team who you're not seeing here was Alaya Santos, who yes, was one hi. of the people who enabled us to be able to dream and to play, as Dila was saying. So Dila was kind of setting us up as you know as as the guide for here are some some directions that you, we could think about going in. Anna, who originally raised the money, right, so that we could say, oh, if you want to buy something, there's a materials budget. There's a space for that, um, and then Alai, our producer, who did many things, but one of the one of the key things. And when you talked about institutions, what I thought about is one day when one of us has a retrospective, they're going to show all the variations, all the versions of the contracts that we didn't sign before we got to the contract that we did sign. And it was mm-hmm. Alai who negotiated those contracts around protecting the artist's rights. So, yes. you know, we, we talk a lot about what we think of traditionally as artistic process, but all of those other things are also what goes into coming into a space and feeling like you can create because you don't have to worry that you're not gonna own your work at the end of it, or you're, you're, you're not going to be able to afford to buy the thing that would actually make the piece what you dream that it would be. So thank you, Alai. Alai, yes, thank you so much for naming that, Rosamond. I think that is absolutely such an important part. And it's a part that often um, doesn't get considered. I think there's so much fixation on the final artistic project. And I think particularly 
as um, as racialized um, artists, right, as artists of color working with these institutions, it is critically important, right, the piece of, of trust, the piece of ownership, the piece of compensation that makes it possible for you to marinate and play, like Zillow says. So I really appreciate you naming that because um, that is something so huge. And I think like amid the sort of um, responses by some institutions to, you know, suddenly care about diversity and inclusion, um, we continue to see um, artists of color be uh, commodified, fetishized, abused, tokenized. And I think um, what you all perform in this project beyond the actual piece, you know, as collaborators, as folks who have value for and love for each other and for the communities that this project is, is thinking about, is addressing, I think, um, is just something that's, that's a huge inspiration given just the, um, the, the continued sort of violence that um, both academic political and artistic institutions, you know, the violence that they that they continue to inflict is just part of their um, modus operandi, right? Um, anyone else want to speak to um, process or your own uh, contribution to sanctuary? I would like to chime in. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's all related to what we've talked about. So sanctuary, those, you know, taking care of artists, conversation between artists, anything. What's not for me separated from everyday life because mm -hmm. we every day, at least, you know, I know uh, most of us struggle in so many ways, especially as people of color. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, you know, systematically not understanding us so there are a lot of struggles every day, just working, dealing with the people. And I feel like I always have to explain, but those explanations never reach them because we don't have the same kind of channels to tune into. And mm. that's one of the really um, tiring things. And uh, sometimes I feel like, ah, I just give up. That kind of feeling happens. And that's really, really tiring and uh, traumatic. But in this group, they have no need to explain. It's not something I'm talking about where they are coming from. That's a huge part of it. But also the heart they bring into this project. It's mm -hmm. not only something that, that they are sympathetic about it. They have the intelligence to wait for others to speak and listen to. And those patients, I, I take it as intelligence that they really have the ability to try to understand it. And uh, that was reflected to how we constructed this piece because the respect here and there was all present. So mm -hmm. it's not something that, that, oh, hey, you should do this because it's gonna get better. No, the all purpose was to really create sanctuary. It's not like, hey, let's create a cool piece that looks good in that way. It's not, it's not like something is bad, but it's, I wouldn't appreciate that kind of process, but it never happened. So if something happens, if one of us asks for feedback or something, it's more of the, you know, I think this way. And also Dilo as a director, he was also asking us questions rather than giving us suggestions and so on. So mm. that kind of the trust that, you know, everyone was talking about that was really built. Uh, during the process of building. And also as a person, uh, you know, my practical uh, uh, personal practice, I used to say gently no to all the collaborative works that I got offered in the past mm -hmm. because making a music performance or anything expressive through a form of art, it's sanctuary to me. And that's the only place that I feel like I can all, you know, Controlling is a bad word to me, but you know, I have the all control of deciding everything. And if right. I make a mistake, it's my mistake. So I don't have to regret it. But if I wanna do something, let's say in this project, specific project at work, I have to collaborate, even though it's my project, someone's gonna talk to me, hey, you should do that and so on. That a lot of pressure comes in, right? And especially mm -hmm. in a society, I grew up as a kid and a woman of color in Japan, I mean, 
Japanese is mostly Japanese people over there too, but there are so much pressure of how you should um, behave as a woman, and you know you are not supposed to speak up and so on, and that kind of thing has been embedded in my uh, like a uh, nature. So even though I try to resist, I should say no to this. It's really hard to do. So because of that, I usually don't collaborate. And when Anna brought up this idea of doing collaborative work with Sanctuary, I thought about it, but since Anna is a wonderful person and also we discussed what Sanctuary will be and things were, we would all create what we wanted to do. Right. It's, we, our goal is to create what our sanctuary would be for per person, but it comes together. And the uh, first idea of doing the in-person performance, I wish it could happen someday, hopefully. But you know that I think we kind of good really had a good idea of intimacy and also reflecting our own ritualistic uh, movement and the reflections to the piece. Then now I just watched the streamed version. I watched the live version earlier today. And I also felt the same feeling of everyone's respecting each other and not really invading. But at the same time, during the um, conversation happened within group, we all contributed somehow to each other. It's not something suggesting you should do this, but you know it was the big support we mutually shared. So that's something I wanted to share. Thank you for that. I love I love hearing um, about that process because it's a process really that is about um, supporting each other to realize, you know, um, an individual vision that is part of a collective vision. And I just think um, I think you know I think that was just so the the richness of that I think was evident in the in the in the finished piece. Um, one thing I wanted to talk a little bit about was the interplay between the visual and the sonic um, that was at play in, in the piece um, and also movement. So um, really um, thinking about like when sound was absent, when sound came in, right? Um, how uh, different affective registers um, were sort of, you know, we moved in and out of, um, out of rage, out of calm, right? Um, out of like um, interiority um, that was like really powerful. So um, yeah, I would just love to hear you all maybe talk a little bit about how um, you each engaged in that sort of push and pull between, um, not push and pull necessarily at all actually, but how you thought about like visuality and, and, and the sonic. I think that's a really beautiful question, Jillian. Thank you. Um, visuality in the sonic. So I think uh, actually it's a Kiko who taught me in this process to think about the sonic in a deeper mm. way. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, Akiko, for that. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I think about I think about the sonic as rhythm. Um, and as timing. So actually like the way the sonic worked in the live performance, Morgan Bates, who is the student um, and trumpeter, a, a master student in the music school um, was basically the timekeeper. And so mm -hmm. Morgan was moving around the circle, the central circle, keeping time by playing sound and the glass jars and with stones and with all these other objects. And that's kind of how I think about sound. Um, mm -hmm. It's for me, it's it's a rhythm that allows me to engage with the ritualistic performance. It's a way of moving through time as I'm moving through space. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know, watching Akiko's work and how Akiko talks about sound. Um, allowed me to think about sound in, in terms of energy 
And I really appreciate that. And so I've been also thinking about that. I was thinking about that today as we were going through the performance of like, what's the energy of the sound? What's the impulse of the sound as, as I'm going through these different registers of movement? Um, yeah, that's, that's what I can say right now. Thank you. Um, I have thoughts on that. You know, I think I had I had think I think I had a very similar response in terms of like lessons learned from this engagement and this collaboration and and like my engagements with Akiko around like what I like about your piece and also what I really liked about Rosamond's piece too was also this kind of like like the way that stillness operates in this piece yes. and kind of just reverberates like the 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 like the moments of stillness or like the moments of silence feel really full they don't feel mm -hmm. empty. and I think you know it's it's interesting because this is a group of people who it's like we are writers and poets and academics and talking and word and text is kind of the currency that we operate in most of the time but I think in my own creative practice I've been moving more and more towards silence and you know some of that is aesthetic but I also think it's political it's you know it's like when we, when we look at the sort of the ways in which white supremacy operates and like the violence that white supremacy produces and requires for its own maintenance, the people who are the objects of that terror are constantly being asked to explain yourself. <laughs> like, why are you terrorized? Why are you angry? Like, you know, and, and people are asking you to narrate that in a way that is palpable, like that is that, well, that's palpable and palatable to them. And I think there's a part of me that as an artist is like, I don't want to explain this anymore. I am done talking. Everything you need to know is in the practice. You want to know how I feel, then just look at me. Because the story, that part of the story actually is in fact self-evident. I'm done talking. So there was something that I, I felt like, you know, in, in my contribution, I wanted to really think about how I could communicate that visually using very little sound. Um, and then being really intentional about what sound I did use and sitting with right. the sound of the bell. And that, that for me, I thought was just, I was so pleased with that. Like, oh, this is, this is way better than talking or trying to narrate how I feel. Um, so that's how, how it operated for me. Thank you so much for that. And, and um, that really resonates um, so much, I think with, with also, I think um, some of my processing of the last five years too. And, um, you know, that, that stillness, that quiet, um, the rest in Rosamond's piece to write that interior space, that rest space, that meditation space. And what I love is that it places the onus on the viewer to do that work of, of interpreting, right. Of listening, of being still themselves, perhaps, and not entertained. Um, right. Um, and I think that that was something also that I think threaded throughout, um, really beautifully, um, in the different tempos and the different textures and the different, um, sounds, um, that sort of came in at different moments. So, um, yeah, absolutely. I love that approach. Yeah, please. Oh, sorry, you're muted. <laughs> sorry, and then I just wanted to add one more thing. And because the other reason why I think the stillness and the silence was so powerful, and you can hear my baby yelling in the background. Love that. And I started yelling. Like I felt, yes. I felt that rage. Like it just can't, it, I just felt it like, like, like surge through me, like from my feet up. It, it was it was extraordinary, and but it was only because you had that space of stillness to let that tension build, and then when you just release that rage, it was like, oh, this is this is a nameless, um, this is a this is a rage beyond sound, like beyond words, and I just need to sit in the space of that, and be really uncomfortable. So that for me, I think was also one of like, for me, I think that the, the way that the sound and movement and the visuals came together was that it created a space where you could just like sit inside of the feeling without needing someone to explain or narrate to you how you were supposed to be experiencing that moment. Absolutely. And I think there was so much I kept thinking about in watching the performance also about embodied knowledge. You know, the fact that like you didn't necessarily need 
words. You didn't necessarily need um, legible forms of articulation because throughout the it's clear to me that you all as artists were taking seriously um traditions long-standing spiritual and aesthetic traditions that understand that the body is a um is a bearer of knowledge and like a, a channel of knowledge and healing um and and to me that that sort of um that sort of attention to um, when and where uh, sound or words came in or not, I think um, that was really important too. So I don't know if there's anything um, else you all wanna share maybe on approaches to um, the body, how the body um, you know, variously sort of um, appears and disappears uh, throughout the piece. And please do send any questions or comments in the Q&A. Um, that will be my last question. And I hope we can have a little bit of conversation. I love the question about the body. And Rosamond, I have I have questions for you. Like, what, Yeah, what, please what, ask each other questions. <laughs> I, was, I mean, but it, it's connected to this question, right? Of how was it for you to move under? Because, right, wrote, like, each person taught me something. And one of the things that, Rosamond, you were like the standard bearer of our joy right? Like you were constantly reminding us like, and joy, right? And the joy. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and Courtney was like, and the body, right? Like, and like our bodies and like, right, the, the sharp political analysis um, that always helps me figure out what it is I'm thinking and saying. And so, um, you know, the embodiment is, at, you're definitely picking up on how important our bodies are to this. Like, it is important that we are who we are in this in this piece, right? Like it is extremely important at every level from the level of production to the level of artistry and aesthetic. Like it was important for us not to be surveilled as we did the live performance because of the bodies we live in. It was important that our bodies take up space on the screen uh, in different ways. And then, yeah, and I mean, I, I want to know for, from just out of curiosity, like Rosamond, what was it like for you to work with the comforter in your body, like inside and outside? I mean, that was just really powerful and beautiful. Yeah. And, um, and I know originally when we were going to do this live, right, we were going to have lots of bodies possibly under that comforter, right? And, and lots of bodies under that intimate space. But yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you, Anna. The, the comforter was always, it was the original image for me, the red satin comforter. And I never had a red satin comforter before, but I did have comforters growing up. Um, or actually, to be more specific, my parents' bed had a comforter. And so the idea of being under it was so cozy and it was so much of a sanctuary that I really wanted to play with that idea. And Interestingly, I was talking to a good friend of mine, um, which was also a good friend of yours, Gabrielle Seville, today, and she said, the body, it disappears in your piece at the end. And to me, it doesn't really disappear because there's kind of a resonance of it, but there's also, we're not looking at an image of nature. We're looking at an image of nature in and reflected in a man-made material of a galvanized bucket that is in a space that clearly there's kind of been brick laid and so on. And so the kind of tangibility and ephemerality of both the body and of nature in different ways was one of the things that I was thinking about. Um, in addition to thinking about in, in the era of this particular pandemic, the absence of bodies in space and yet the way in which some of us were ended up in places where we were closer to nature, perhaps than we would have been before, or if you could get to a park, there perhaps wouldn't be as many people as there would be normally. Um, and so those are some of the things that I was thinking about in terms of embodiment. And um, the last thing I'll just, I'll say about that is, I think uh, I say yes to everything, Anna, that you said in terms of it's important what our bodies look like, who our bodies are, um, but I often don't necessarily portray the face. Um, because I think that that's, that's, it's a way of keeping something back for the self, right? That, that if the face is how we're identified, usually, then I get to keep that for myself, even as 
I'm insistent on my body being in the frame. Mm, I love that. Thank you. Any other like questions that the artists have for each other or comments or anything? I want to know if anything went wrong or was surprising in the process for anybody. Okay, no, I mean, from where I stand, nothing went wrong, but what was surprising for me was that we did this, um, not in a bad way, but more like, <laughs> more like uh, I'm very anachronistic. Like I'm, I'm very analog as an artist, right? Like writing my novels by hand in journals is, I, like I write my my novels by hand in journals. I don't wow. type them, you know. Like I, uh, the the lived embodied experience of performance is what brings me the deepest joy. And the minute you introduce technology, I'm like, what? <laughs> um, I'm definitely like I'm 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 so astonished that I live in this age and can manage things like Zoom. So, um, so when Dilo was when Dilo was like, oh, so we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna reimagine this and we're gonna have live performance with uh, pre-recorded, you know, uh, performances. And I was just like, what? Like, I don't, so it was amazing to me what the tech team did, what Megan Lau and me Straling and Kisa and Beck working with Dilo, what they achieved today. And um, it was just incredible to witness and to learn from distantly. I learned from it and just appreciate it. And like really, really learned that, um, that if you work with an incredible tech team, then incredible things are possible. Um, so I don't know, did, do you wanna to speak to this question? Yeah, I, you know, it's like one of those things, like did anything go like awry? Um, yes, and it was supposed to be what it needed to be. I feel like, um, you know, it was a learning experience for me because I, I figured, you know, I grew up, you know, being like we had a TV, but I was the remote control, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so it, I feel like, you know, now we're in this place where I was like, I feel like we can live stream this even outside and we will um, have pre-recorded and I know somebody who will be our, you know, technical DJ and make sure that whatever is being live streamed looks a particular way. I would have loved, I think that one of the things that I, like, I was like, oh man, is because the timings in the live performance um, were a, a little bit shorter to accommodate some of the, um, or, or, or actually were already shorter. And I think that had I known that the times might have been drawn out in the live performance as live performance when you are in these ritual performances, time is all over the place, that, um, that there were moments with the live performers that I would have loved to have sort of frame the actual pre-recorded mm. bits. So, um, and, and they were, it was just like maybe a minute or two off and nobody could tell obviously, but, but for me, I was like, oh, I will account for this next time, you know? Um, because there was some really beautiful, powerful images that were coming from the live performances that didn't get to be live streamed. Um, and I think that was the only thing, but it was very interesting to be calling a show as if I would be calling a, a, a live show for live cameras and, um, and having that ability to do this outside with very strong ethernet and a tech team that troubleshot everything they could. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you all got to see, but there was this beautiful drone shot that we got in the yeah. end that we didn't know if we were gonna have that up or not. And it was almost like our, um, you know, the thing that we all wanted and needed, but we didn't know if we could afford <laughs> and, uh, time-wise and like ev everything-wise and it managed to come together and so in that way I feel like we might have I might have personally felt like oh man on one or two things of course it at the end of the day those didn't matter but on the other hand I gained in getting access to seeing like oh how can we use visual shots 
to give some sort of like not an ending necessarily but like a like closure you know so um those are those are the things um and by the way when I talked to Anna about tech and I was like we're gonna do this day Anna didn't go uh what Anna was like um what the I don't know about that like I like <laughs> so so Anna's saying how she responded is a very light response but I tell you it was a deeper more more like you know I, I'm no and I was like no no it's, it'll be fine I promise it'll be painless it'll be painless <laughs> and it was, and I learned so much and and yay <laughs> That's what the collab is for. That is what the that's collab right. is for. That's right. That's right. So, I mean, even in our group, I think that some people had more technological or tech, were more tech savvy than others, but everything works and everything, like, as long as we're using these technologies in the way that really reflect what's what we want to say, like, I think I, it's just a testament to how we create during this time where we're not able to have everything be live and in person. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and merging seamlessly with that, uh, we have a question uh, from an attendee who writes, the circle was a through line. Would you all speak to what that means to you and the work? Uh, for me, the circle is just the gathering and it's how, how I gather with others. Um, the circle is absolutely important um, uh, for the live piece. And I know that there were resonances with the circle of the water in Courtney's piece, the circle of the bucket in Rosemont's piece and the circle of wax um, mm. that kept appearing in Akiko's piece. And um, for me, like nature is very circular. And so I, I don't know, that's what I can say right now, but uh, the circle for me is how we gather. It's, it's what allows us to look and see everybody's, you know, see everybody at the same time. We can turn and see everybody. Uh, and there are no hierarchies. Uh, there are just, Right, there are just energies that are holding the circle together. Mm -hmm. I love that. Does anyone else want to address that question? Yeah, I'll chime in. So circle, you know, it's such a great question. I didn't realize it until someone mentioned it, but it's so true. And uh, it's related to something that, you know, like a physiological or physical um, stuff when you drop something because of the um, gravity and so on that when you when I dropped the salt it you know naturally formed a circle too but what I was trying to do either consciously or unconsciously in the uh, section of the piece was circle can be a boundary that I can protect myself from the others so it's a safe place at the same time someone can bury you inside of the circle and you hide hide yourself forever so it can be in both ways. So it depends on how you use the kind of a space or area. It can be both, you know, great or something horrifying. So that kind of thing I felt like from particularly my, my own uh, cycle I was creating. Thank you for that. Well, I wanna thank you all for this moving, brilliant, ground shifting work and praxis. Um, I hope that you all get some good rest today. Um, I'm sure it's been a lot. I hope you're taking care of yourselves. Um, I can't wait to see what further permutations follow from this. Um, thank you so much um, for this work. And thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Jillian, for facilitating. Bye. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Jillian. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. You.